Hello! Welcome to another in my ongoing series of video game development tutorials. Um, this is the second in my series of 3D game tutorials that is uh, uh, video game development that uh, is about 3D games instead of 2D games. Uh, so, uh, as usual, we'll be doing the normal thing of uh, firing up our uh, Microsoft Visual C Sharp 2010 Express Edition and uh, building a project, getting it to work, and then seeing, uh, exploring it and seeing how we can expand it. So, uh, as usual, we want to go to learning.eochu.com and uh, check out Project Puck. That's it, Puck as in Hockey Puck, because we're going to make a digital virtual uh, air hockey table. And as you can see here on this web page, we will, uh, we, we've got downloadable files here, and I will start the download. But you know what I'm also going to do? I'm also going to fire up my C Sharp 2010 Express Edition, and I'm going to make a new project. New project. Uh, XNA Game Studio 4.0. Lorraine Teaching Talks is a good place to put it. I'm going to call this Project Puck. Not a capital Puck, just because the files I'm giving you already assume a, uh, a namespace, which is C-sharp parlance, um, a Puck with a lowercase. So we'll keep that and just make an empty project. Here we go, loading up the empty project. Build, build, think, 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 build. Right, and now that I've got the empty project, I can hit F5 on my keyboard to run the project, and there we go, I've got the blue screen of happiness. So, um, uh, it's time that I have the empty project, it's time to take all the downloadable files, and put them into the right directory locations. I've got several texture colors, and a game1.cs file, which as we know is programming, and this is these .x files, which are 3D mesh files. They're the .x format, which along with .xnb are the two formats that are native to XNA system. So if you can get your 3D model in an XNB or a .x format, then you should be able to add them to your project and be able to display them on the screen. So let's uh, let's try and get all this data extracted down now. All right there we go. Puck, puck content. I'm going to put all this stuff in puck content because really the only thing that doesn't belong in puck content is the .cs file. I'm going to move that over. Take this .cs back to puck. And copy over the existing game1.cs. Now when I bring back my development ID, of course I get the dialog saying, you've changed that file. Why, yes I have. Let's actually fire up the file and see what we get. I see blue. I don't see anything else. There's a reason for that. Number one, it, because we changed the file without actually changing the date of the file, the IDE didn't recompile it. So it didn't decide that it didn't decide to pick up the new.cs file, the new game1.cs file and recompile it and see what it said. If it did, it would have errored out because we also did not add any of our art assets to the, uh, the, the Solution Explorer. So let's do that now. Let's uh, right click Add Existing Item. And we've got all these things, but what I really want to do is just add the .x files. I don't want to add anything else. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. Now that I've added them, I'm going to re-hit F5 and see what happens. Okay, I still don't see anything. Probably because this file, the game1.cs, has not actually been updated. So I'll just hit space, changing the file, and then the next time I hit F5, it'll resave the file and update it, and there we go. So you can see in this game now that I've got what looks like a snow white air hockey table with a red puck and a green paddle. And if I move my mouse around, I can control the paddle with my mouse, which is pretty cool. Now, what's also noticeable is that 
if uh, the, the camera is constantly tracking the puck. There's a camera, its location is behind the table a little ways and above the table a little ways, but it always tracks the puck. And we'll look into the code and see why it's so aggressively tracking the puck. But something, something else we notice here that we'll probably find in the code is the fact that as the puck moves along, it slows down. I think more than likely it slows down because it bounces off of one of the edges of the walls of the air hockey table, and in doing so, the reflection speed is somehow lessened, and over time, it slows down. So I can almost touch it with the paddle. I'm going to wait for it to do that, and then I'm going to push forward and boom, hit it. Now, this paddle is not a really optimal physical um, model, and we can get into that too. As you can see, I'm pushing the paddle straight through the puck. But I am getting the paddle to the puck to bounce off the paddle, which is pretty nice. So now I've got the, the, the puck moving and the paddle bouncing, and it's the table. So, there's a couple of things when we think about 3D games that I really want to talk about before we delve into the code. One of the key aspects that we see here that we'll see in a lot of 3D games is that the game isn't really in 3D, which is to say, the, the display or the representation of the game might be in 3D, but the actual mechanics of the game happen on a 2D plane. In my opinion, there's nothing really wrong with this. In fact, that's, it's kind of cool. It's kind of usable. You can always take a 2D game and keep the actual action of the game on a 2D plane, but display it in 3D. What's wrong with that? Um, and that gets to the larger issue, which is the other thing I want to talk about, which I've said before, which is that when we make 3D games, we're always lying to our players. Lie, 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 we're, we're a bunch of big liars. And the reason I say that is because in 3D drawing, the presentation has so little to do with the rest of the game. Uh, we all know that we're drawing just a bunch of triangles, and they're triangles that are empty and flat and don't have any built-in collision detection. When we build a 3D mesh on the screen like this, uh, like this hockey table, we know it's empty, and we know we can pass right through it if we want to. The, all of the collision detection and resolution that could be in our game, we have to do ourselves as a separate step from actually drawing something. So in that sense, we are never being truthful with our player. When we draw a mountain, we, the player understands that that's a solid mountain that you can't walk through, but that's not the truth. We, whenever we draw 3D, we draw these, these empty husks of things made out of triangles. And it's up to us to build our physics simulators so that when you try to go through the mountain, you're, you are forbidden from going through the mountain. So that we can give our players the sense that the mountain is solid inside when in fact we know it is not. That's just how 3D art on a computer is right now. So another aspect of lying all the time to our players is the idea that we can get away with a 2D mechanical game that is presented in 3D, so it looks really cool 3D. But we all know that this, this air hockey table is actually just in two dimensions. So let's actually dig down into the code and actually look at how the air hockey table is built and how the game functions. I'm looking here at game1.cs, which is the only, con the only programming file we have in this project. Starting at the top, we've got our very normal usings and our namespace, our game1 class, and under here we uh, create our normal stuff, our, our graphics and our sprite batch. Here we create three models. Now what are models? We did this in the last assignment, the spinning spaceship, but now we're using more models. Models are the 3D meshes that we load from the .x data files. Uh, models are a collection of triangles. More specifically, a collection of vertexes, which are the points of each triangle that contain information like color and position and normal facing and UV for the texturing. Um, in this case, this code says we've got a box model, a box model 2, and a cylinder model. The cylinder model we're going to use for the puck. It comes already associated with the red texture. 
the box model and the box model 2 are the ones for the paddle and for the parts of the table. And we'll see how we create the table from a simple cube. So then here we have two matrices, a projection matrix and a camera matrix. Remember our basic 3D game development theory. There's three matrices that magically make the world. Our projection matrix, our world matrix, and our camera matrix. Our world matrix is also called the object matrix because it moves the object into position. Our camera matrix is also called our view matrix. It shows where the camera is and uh, allows the parts of the world to be oriented relative to the camera as a second step after the world or, or object matrix. And then the third final matrix, the projection matrix or the screen matrix, is used to take the transformed results of the other two matrices and squish them down onto the 2D plane of our computer screen so that we actually get a 3D view uh, as though our computer screen were a window into a 3D world. Those three matrices, just can't forget them. You know, they're the basic matrices that, uh, that let us set up and, and draw a 3D scene correctly. So I got my projection matrix and my camera matrix probably means that the world matrix will, or the, that is the object matrix will be created later. And then we've got a couple of vector threes. What are vector threes? They're literal vector threes. They contain an X, Y, and Z value denoting a three space position. You know, in 2D games, we have an X and a Y, and those two numbers tell us where an object is on the screen. But in 3D games, we need a third dimension. We need the Z dimension, which is in and out. And that third dimension uh, is piled together into a vector three. And so we have a vector three for the puck position and puck velocity, and we have paddle position and paddle position last. And if you think about it, the difference between paddle position and paddle position last versus puck position and puck velocity, very similar. One is encoding the position currently and the other is encoding the velocity. And we'll, we'll see how that works a little later on. Then we've got our constructor for game one. That's perfectly normal. Never seen those before. That's a little joke. Here's our initialize. Nothing new there. Here's where we load content. So we create our sprite batch as normal. But you know what? Sprite batch is not really for 3D anyway. It's for 2D. Uh, so in this case, it's legacy code, um, unless we start drawing some 2D overlay stuff like uh, score, which is not a bad idea. And then we have box model, box model 2, and cylinder model. We do content load of model, and that's how we actually get those three models into the game. All right, the next line calculates the aspect ratio. Remember, the aspect ratio is just the width divided by the height of the screen. That uh, gives uh, uh, the projection matrix part of the information it needs to build itself. And of course we immediately use aspect ratio in the next line calling matrix dot create perspective field of view. It's just a built-in function in XNA, in XNA's matrix class specifically. It's nice to have you fill out the fill in the blanks and it pro provides you a projection matrix. In this case the arguments of create perspective field of view include uh, 45 degrees. Now Notice that I use two radians because uh, most of these math functions require radians as an angle instead of degrees. Uh, so just so you just try not to get those confused, even though it is kind of confusing. And then aspect ratio is the second argument. <clears throat> and then the third and fourth arguments are going to be the near and far planes. What do I mean by that? Well, I've already mentioned the idea of a frustrum. It's a six-sided, oddly-shaped box that corresponds to all the things that you can see in your 3D field of view on your video game. So it's kind of a box like that with a backside, and it's shaped like this on the sides and on the top and bottom as well. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's almost like a square cone or a four-sided pyramid with the top chopped off. It's a viewing frustrum, the shape of what you can see in the 3D world through your 2D projected screen computer monitor. The viewing frustrum is basically what we try to create with our projection matrix here. Um, and part of the frustrum is, of course, the front plane, the, 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 the nearest to you, and the far plane, farthest to you. Uh, it, it, anything closer to you than the near plane 
we don't draw that. Anything farther from you than the far plane, we also don't draw that. So this, in this particular case, I'm saying that anything closer than one or anything farther than looks like 10,000 doesn't get drawn. And of course, we can adjust those numbers as we like to make sure that the fidelity of the display is how we like it. All right, so we've created our projection matrix, and for this particular example, we're not going to touch it again. That's the only projection matrix we're going to be. We're going to need to use throughout the life of this program. So our next arguments just set up initial value. We set up the puck position. We set up the initial velocity. Notice that the ball, sorry, the puck has an initial x speed and an initial z speed, but no y speed. Because again, we're, the actual game we're playing is on a 2D plane, where y is always 0. And then we set paddle position. And paddle position, in this case, remember z is in and out, which means that since paddle is close to us, our paddle is close to us. That means that z is positive towards us. Okay, which means that if we have something negative 150 in the z direction, it would be on the far side of the table from us. Alright, so we've looked at load content. Unload content doesn't have anything as usual. Now here we go with the update function. And there's a good amount going on here in the update function. Uh, this first part is a real throwback piece of code that I'm not even sure I should have put in there since it's just for the gamepad. And then here we go, building the camera matrix. So remember we already built the projection matrix. We have three matrices to build. This is the camera matrix. And once again, we're using a built-in function that Microsoft provided for us called create look at. And all we're doing here is filling in the blanks for the create look at arguments. What does it need? It needs the location of the camera, the location of whatever the camera is looking at, and a direction of up. What is the direction of up? Remember in our, uh, I think our left-handed uh, three-dimensional world space where this is Z and this is Y and this is X, our up will be Y. So if we want a normal, that is a, a three vector that points upward, that's pretty simple. That means X and Z are zero and Y is equal to one. And that's exactly what we'll have here, but vector three dot up is already built in for us by Microsoft to be 0, 1, 0. So that's all we're doing. And the reason for that is so that the camera can know which way is up. Because if we adjust that, then the camera could go sideways, which in some games could be a really cool feature, but not in this game. So uh, the other two arguments, again, are the first argument is where the camera is, and the second argument is where the camera wants to look at. So obviously we're always going to look at the puck because we're looking at puck position. And this new vector 3 says that the camera is 0 in the x direction, so it's not off to one side. It's 250 up in the y direction and it's 500 back in the z direction because towards us is, po is positive z. So it's twice as far from the table in the z direction as it is in the, uh, in the up in the y direction. Okay, so we've created the camera matrix, two out of three. Now move the puck. Puck position plus equal puck velocity. Now we've seen this before. This code simply says that puck velocity is modified by elapsed game time milliseconds. This helps us make the game run at the same speed no matter what computer we're running it on. Okay, so we're doing this, this calculation saying keep the puck position incrementing by the puck velocity. And now we have this code. And I'm going to come back to what this means after we look at drawing because it's really associated with how we draw. Remember I was just saying that the 3D drawing that we do is kind of a lie. It doesn't have anything to do with the, the physics or the, or the uh, collision detection in our game. So we're forced to do our own collision detection in physics. Um, and usually that's in our, in our tick function or our update function. So we're going to first look at how we build the table in our draw function and then we'll come back and this will make a little more sense. So I'm going to skip ahead here to where we talk about moving the paddle. Okay, you see that? Move the paddle. 
uh, mouse state get state. We've done that before. We're just getting the current state of the mouse. And then we're just uh, setting paddle position X and paddle position Z. Um, these calculations are kind of wah at the beginning with some magic numbers, but what we're really doing here with paddle position X is we're just taking our mouse position across the screen and trying to multiply it and subtract it and turn it into something that fits on, on the, uh, the, the uh, air hockey table. In first the X position and then the Z position because remember our game is on a 2D plane, Y is always zero. So then we say if puck is within width of the paddle, this is where we're actually doing collision detection and resolution for the paddle. And it's cheap. It's actually not very good, but it works and we could do better, but let's start off with the simple. Um, and the first thing we do is say, you know, the puck has got to be within the bound sideways of the paddle for there to be any collision at all. So let's check that. The X direction is sideways. So we say if puck position X is less than paddle position X plus 20 and puck position X is greater than paddle position X minus 20, in other words we have a 20 on either side change from the puck and we're seeing, I'm you know, sorry, if the paddle, and we're seeing if the puck is inside those bounds. Now remember that's the paddle center and the puck center. It's not how wide either of them are at this point.